Jesus, we're seeking after you this morning. Sing, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. author of every one of our stories. Jesus, have your way in each and every one of our lives, Father. Speak so clearly to your people, Lord. We thank you that when we seek, we will find. Jesus, that's a promise. You're always answering. You're always answering your children. We see that in Psalm 34, 4. Jesus, we seek you. We put you first. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our lives. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You guys may be seated. Well, good morning, Mercy Road. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now I'm gonna take a moment to invite the ushers forward as we continue worship 
with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Thank you so much for all of your generosity. Well, here at Mercy Road, we believe that church is meant for so much more than a Sunday service and that you get more out of church when you get connected with us. We want to get to know you and pray for you. So take some time right now and fill out a Connect card. You can either scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you and select Connect card or fill out the physical copy you received on your way in and just drop it in the baskets as the ushers come around. And hey, if you're new with us, welcome. Take that Connect card to the first step table after service where we would love to get to know you and we've got a free gift there for you as well. Well, speaking of our first step table, our first step class is next Sunday. First step is the very first thing to do along our engagement pathway. It's just a one hour casual class for you to come meet some of our staff, get to know who we are as a church and find out easy ways that you can get connected. You can register by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you or just stop at the first step table in the lobby. After the first step class, Rooted is the next step on our engagement pathway. Rooted is a 10 week experience designed for you to grow in your faith and grow in community. Rooted has the potential to have a bigger impact on your spiritual growth than anything you do this year. So we highly encourage you to get registered for Rooted. You can either scan the QR code on that seat back in front of you or stop at the Rooted table in the lobby after service. Well, as always, we have so many amazing things happening in the life of our church, like our All Moms Unite breakfast, our student summer trip, and so much more. So make sure you are staying up to date with our weekly newsletter, our social media, and our website for upcoming events and all things Mercy Road. All right, church, now it's time for your Social 15, where you get 15 seconds to say hi to someone around you. Your Social 15 starts right now. Good morning, Mercy Road. How are you guys doing this morning? Yeah, good. It is so good to be with you all. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, excited to jump in together today. Some are joining online as well. Can we put our hands together and welcome them? Let them know we're glad they're here. If you're watching this live, share this because you never know how God could use this to impact somebody. And you know, if you're new with us, something we say every single week around here is that no one is too far from God to experience a life change through Jesus. And that the church should be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. So I don't know what you walked into this room uh, with today, or even if you're watching online right now, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I just want to let you know that you are welcome here, that the God that we're going to be talking about, the God that we believe in and serve is one who loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's in your past, and he wants to meet you right where he's at, and he wants to transform your life which is why we're a hospital for sinners because we don't just go to the hospital to stay where we're at. We go there to get better. And so we just believe that as a church and we started this church for people just like you to meet you right where you're at today. And that's my prayer for you as we get into this time together. Well, I, I want to celebrate a couple of things right off the bat here. Uh, first, I want to celebrate that last week was Easter. We did Easter at Carmel High School, two services. And in those two services, we had dozens of people that raised a hand to commit their lives to Jesus for the first time ever. Maybe some recommit their lives to Jesus as well. So can we just celebrate all of that right now and how God is moving and how he's working? Those lives that are being transformed and impacted, and a lot of that has to do with you and your commitment, so thank you so much for that. And also to pull off something like that, it took a lot of just staff, dozens and dozens of volunteers to make that possible, so can we thank them as well for all the work that they did preparing for that? Yeah, it was an incredible Easter, and uh, yeah, so excited to continue to hear some stories about what God is doing through that. I also do want to celebrate... Um, it pains me to say this, but the Purdue Boilermakers advancing to the national championship game. How about that? Yeah. Um, my brother-in-law actually played basketball at NC State, and so it wasn't the outcome we were praying for as a family. But nonetheless, we'll celebrate you Purdue fans and uh, get to enjoy this win, and I cannot wait to see how the outcome of the game is going to be this coming week. And when you think about Purdue, though, Think about the comeback that they've made this season. You guys remember last year? How they lost in the first round to a team that nobody's ever heard of? 
And they go from losing in the first round to this year, advancing to the final round. I mean, that's a heck of a comeback. Definitely worth celebrating that. And if, you, if you're a big uh, sports fan, you know this, that comebacks, we, we live for comebacks when it, when it comes to sports. Because everybody loves a good comeback story, like what Purdue's doing this year. Or maybe you've been to a game where your team is down, but they end up coming back and pulling it off. We all love a good comeback. And this week, we're kicking off a new teaching series called The Comeback that flows directly out of what we celebrated last week. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but what Jesus did in the Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection is the single greatest comeback of all time. Think about that. You're a follower of Jesus. He calls you to follow him, and you're going along. You're gaining some momentum. This movement is starting, and then boom, he's arrested. He's crucified, and he's buried. Just think about how crushed they would have been. All hope would have been lost. They would have been devastated in the moment. And then Jesus says, just kidding. Three days later, on Sunday, the stone is rolled away. He walks out of the grave, conquering sin and death, victorious, stands, and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Come on, that's a comeback if I've ever seen one. Are you guys excited about that or what? I mean, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. As you can tell, I am getting a little excited about that because the resurrection is so powerful. And here's why it's so powerful. Because the same Jesus that pulled off the greatest comeback of all time ever is still in the business of making comebacks happen even today. That he's transforming lives. And that's why in the series, we're talking about how no one is too far from God. Because you will see that the risen Jesus will encounter so many people. And they get to experience their own comeback as well. Because the resurrection, because it really did happen, it means that any other comeback is possible. As one pastor puts it, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Some powerful stories of comebacks. And we're going to be diving in with Peter's story today. So if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Matthew 26. We're going to be looking at Peter's story, Matthew 26. We'll be jumping around a little bit, so hopefully if you have a paper Bible, you're good at flipping pages because we'll be looking at a lot of scripture. Typically, I take one passage and I just walk through it, but we'll be jumping around a little bit today. And if you have your smart device with you, get ready to scroll a bunch on there as well. But we're going to be looking at the story of Peter and starting out in Matthew 26. And what you see from Peter is that Peter is the zealous disciple who is bold, made some bold promises to Jesus about his commitment to Jesus. And when push came to shove, Peter ends up denying Jesus three different times, and he fails miserably. But after the resurrection, Jesus comes and he finds Peter. and tells him, Peter, get up. It's time for your comeback. Because I'm not done with you yet. There's still so much more that I want to do in and through you. Are you guys excited to study God's word together this morning? All right, three of you are. All right, let's jump in. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 30. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, we're jumping in here. It's Thursday night before the crucifixion that happens on Friday. And they've partaken the Last Supper together. He's told them to do communion. He's predicted that he's going to be betrayed by Judas. And he's going to be crucified, put to death. And then he's going to come back from the dead. But now it says, after supper... Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me on this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 whoa. hang on, hang on. I, I, I didn't hear you right. I think you just said that all of us are going to scatter and like run away when like you're arrested and like crucified. Uh, Jesus, I think you got that wrong, by the way. Um, not me, though. Like maybe these other guys, I don't know about these other guys, maybe they might desert you, but like not me. Look at what Peter says to Jesus. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus says to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter again says to Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Have you ever argued with God before? What's so ironic about this is that Jesus is quoting Old Testament prophecy that is written about what's about to happen. That the shepherd is going to get struck down and all the sheep are going to scatter. And Peter is like, yeah, Jesus, I know, uh, I, I know you said those things, but like, you don't understand though. That's true for like somebody else, but not for me. Peter is literally arguing with God and all the prophets. And I've just come to find that when we argue with God, usually it doesn't end well. 
because he usually wins. And that's what happens. It doesn't end well for Peter. Turns out that Jesus and all the prophets were right. Jesus is betrayed. They carry him away to the high priest and they take him into the high priest's court. And Peter now is following along. And it says this in John 18, verse 16. Peter stood outside of the door and the other disciple who was known to the high priest went in and he spoke to a servant girl who was keeping watch at the door to bring Peter in. So the servant girl at the door said to Peter, hey, are you not? One of this man's disciples, like she recognizes Peter as one of Jesus' disciples in this moment. And look at Peter's response. He said, I am not. And she's like, wait, I think I, think I know you from somewhere. Aren't you that guy? Aren't you from Galilee? Like I, I hear a little bit of an accent on you. I don't know. You kind of smell like fish, like one of those fishermen for Galilee. And Peter's like, no, 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 that's not me. That's a different guy. I don't even know Galilee. I've never been there. I'm from Jericho. You just heard me wrong. I don't even like fish. I'm allergic to fish. I'm a vegetarian. He's like doing everything he can to deny in this moment. And it says that the servants were uh, and the officers were, they had made a charcoal fire that they were standing around and warming themselves because it was cold. And Peter goes, and now he's standing with them. So he just denied the servant girl, and he goes, stands with them. And they, too, recognize him. They're like, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples that we know of? Again, he denies, and he says, I am not. And a third time, now a guy will come forward and say, hey, did I not see you in the garden? Yeah, I know you. You're, you're that guy that chopped off my cousin's ear. It was you. And he's like, no, nope, got the wrong guy. That's not me. Three times, Peter is going to deny Jesus. Three different times. And it says that at once the rooster crowed. All that even if everybody else denies you, I will never deny you talk. Went right out the window. The second that push came to shove and there's some real pressure and some real danger, some real fear. And Peter fails miserably. Here's what I've come to find is that if you live long enough, most likely you are going to experience failure in your own life. And some of those failures are going to be small things that you can easily just shake off and just keep moving on with your life. But most likely, if you live long enough, too, because we live in a fallen world, then mo most likely you will also experience some big failures in your life. Like maybe for you, it'll be the failed relationship that you attempted that didn't work out for you. Or maybe for some of you, it's the failed marriage that you tried and ended badly in divorce. Or maybe the failed business venture that you tried and just failed and you're now dealing with all the financial uh, consequences of that. Or maybe it's a failed project. Maybe it's the failure in your finances that you will experience at some point. And every single one of us at some point will experience some sort of big failure in our lives. For some of you, even the failure that you will experience is that you will fall into sin and you are going to fail God. The very thing that you said I will never do, you find yourself in the place, man, I, 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 I've done that thing now like Peter. What do I do with that? And here's the danger, is that if we're not careful, we can go on with life. And those big failures that we experience in our lives can really begin to take root in our hearts in the same way that success can sometimes go to your head. Failure can go to your heart and take root in your heart and can begin to define some of us for the rest of our lives if we're not careful. And so I want to look at Peter's story today. And I want to show you from Peter's story that this Jesus that we've been talking about, who we celebrated last week, his resurrection, the greatest comeback of all time, that that same Jesus makes the comeback from failure to fruitful possible. Because that's what he does. That we serve a God of comebacks who's in the business of redeeming all kinds of failures in you and in my life. And he can take even our failures and use them for his glory and for our good. If you surrender your failure to him, he can take your failures and use them even to make you more fruitful and more fit for the kingdom. And to have an impact like you could never imagine. Because we serve a God of comebacks. And Jesus is in the business of redeeming our failures and using it to, make it to make us more fruitful for him. Will you pray with me? God, I just pause right now, and I know that there's just so many things going on, uh, even just today alone, so many people that have family members who are sick or who are sick themselves, and just all kinds of things happening right now. And 
in the midst of all of that, we acknowledge your, pre your presence. God, that you are here actually right now in this room or with that person who's watching online right now, that you are right there with them. And God, that you want to not just be here in the room, but God, that you want to meet us here. You want to speak to us today, a word that is meant to be encouraging to us, a word that is meant to transform us, a word that is meant to help us to follow you even more. So I just pray that you'd allow me to just step out of the way right now. Would I just convey your words in a way that is clear and compelling and challenging to every single person, myself included in that. So God, we just invite you to speak to us, every single one of us. Would you meet us right where we are today? You know every thought, every emotion, every anxiety, every fear that we have in this moment. And God, I pray that you just meet us right where we are right now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You know, we, uh, we lived in Illinois for uh, several years, over a decade before we moved to Indiana. So I spent a good chunk of my life there. And uh, there's a lot of things I like about Illinois. There's a lot of things I don't like about Illinois that I love about Indiana more. And one of the things I don't like about Illinois is uh, their taxes are ridiculous over there. I don't know if you knew that, but like, their taxes are absolutely outrageous. And the state is still in debt. Okay, I'm going to stop going on about Illinois. But... Um, lived there for over uh, a decade and experienced all of that. And the other thing I didn't like about Illinois is that they have traffic cameras like all over the entire state. So you just can't get away with stuff. Speeding, you can't get away with. You can't, there's just cameras, I'm telling you, like everywhere. And so when we lived in Illinois, it just so happens that one day I'm driving to the church where I was serving at at the time. I'm pulling up on this really busy like intersection that was close to the church and there's one of those uh, red lights where you can like make a turn, you know, on red, where you stop, but then you make the turn right there. And as I'm pulling up, there's another car that comes up next to me. So I'm like, let me just inch forward a little bit more. As I'm doing that, there's like a semi that is coming. And I did what every responsible driver would do. I sped up rather than stopping. <laughs> and as I speed up to make that right turn, I just see the flash of the camera. And I'm like, yep, they got me. Surely enough. Two weeks later, in the mail comes this ticket with a pretty decent amount on there that I'm supposed to pay, or I can go to court and argue my way out of it. And there's even a link on there, go watch this video to show you exactly how you screwed up. That's what Illinois does. So I go on the link and I look at it, and surely enough, it shows me rolling and blowing right through that stop sign. And I'm like, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to go to court and argue this ticket. So surely enough... The court date shows up and I show up to this court locally there and it's in a room full of people and we're all sitting there. You get a number and like they call up your number and your case and you go stand before the judge and you answer some questions and then he decides basically what the case, the case what's going to happen with the case. So it gets to my turn and I get up in this room full of people, go and stand before the judge and he says a couple of like legal jargon terms that I didn't know what they meant. So I'm like, can you please talk to me like I'm five so I can actually understand? So he like re repeated a couple things. He could see I didn't understand. He's like, sir, what are you trying to do today? I'm like, well, I'm here to like dispute this ticket that I got. He's like, all right, uh, play the video. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. So surely enough, they play the video and here I am blowing right through that stop sign and he just looks back at me and he's like, so what's the problem? I'm like, well, you don't understand. See, as I was speeding up, there's like this car over here, another semi over there. And you know, when you're sitting here, it's like at a 45 degree angle. And so I had to like inch my way. And he's like, it doesn't matter. You broke the law. Like you have to pay for this ticket. Sends me home with the ticket. Not only did I end up paying for the ticket, I also got the added bonus of being embarrassed in a room full of people and made a fool of myself in that room that I was in. And here's what I've come to find in my life sometimes is that failure can be a great teacher. Failure can be a great teacher. And that's what you see from Peter's story with this failure that he goes through. Uh, all the gospels, by the way, record Peter's failure. Uh, that there's some stories that are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John. But no, not, not in this case. Like, Every single one of them wrote about Peter's failure. And I love so much what Luke writes in Luke 22. It says that when Peter had immediately denied Jesus again, it says, immediately the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered what he had said to him. And it says that he went out and he wept 
bitterly in that moment. If you've watched any of the Jesus films or Son of God, anything like that, this scene is portrayed in such a powerful way where Jesus is there, he's bloodied, he's being beaten, and Peter's back there denying him, and he just turns and he just looks at Peter, and Peter realizes in that moment, I have failed, and he leaves, and he weeps bitterly. Peter realizes, Jesus was right all along, and I'm a moron. Like Jesus and all the prophets were actually right. They knew what they were talking about. I did it and I found in my own life that I tend to learn more from my failures than I do my successes. That failure oftentimes exposes areas of our lives that need to be addressed actually. And that I've started to, with failure, there's some unhealthy ways that we can respond, but there's also some healthy ways that we can respond with failure. What I've started to do more, realizing that failure can be a great teacher, is I've started to ask a lot of why questions. Like, for example, okay, I told a lie, and a lot of people can beat themselves up about it and move on or even make statements like, well, I'm just a liar, I struggle with integrity or whatever, and when you, when you encounter a situation like that in your life, I've started to ask some of the why questions. Like, okay, I told a lie, why did I tell a lie? Why did I feel like I couldn't be truthful in that moment? And when you begin to ask some of those questions, oh, man, I told that lie because, man, I care so much about my self-image. I, I care what people think about me. I want to look good. And so I felt like if I would actually just tell the truth in that situation, it would have made me look bad. And so it was easier for me to lie. But you see how you begin to actually learn from your failures. Or maybe I got angry with my wife and kids. Why did I get angry with my wife and kids? Oh, man, that's right. I'm like an achiever, get it done, go, go, go kind of person. And my wife and kids do a healthy thing in my life. They slow me down sometimes and actually force me to be present in the moments and what that can lead to when I'm not getting done what I think I need to go accomplish and achieve. I can get frustrated and that comes out in anger. And sometimes God uses that to remind me, hey, it's okay to slow down. Like you're not what you can achieve. Like I just love you for you. And when we begin to ask some of those why questions, you'll come to find that failure can be a great teacher for us as it becomes for Peter. And how we respond in failure reveals a lot about our character. Like maybe you've watched this too, but you watch a sports game and like the one team is down, they're just getting beat so bad. And then you begin to see how people respond when they lose a game. Like there's the players that will just keep composure and they're classy despite the loss. And then there's the people that, you know, throw a fit. They get pulled out of the game. They're going to sit down. They're like chucking the Gatorade bottle. They're like kicking chairs over, taking their jersey off, like walking out of there. And you can just tell a lot about a person's character when things begin to go wrong. Maybe some of you even have coworkers like that. That you love them, love working with them. But man, that is not the person you want to be around when things are not going well. And maybe you are that person as well. And listen, when failure happens, it's a great opportunity that can teach us, that can reveal areas of our lives that need to be actually addressed. And some people don't respond well to failure, and they fail to see failure as a great teacher. But, but here's the thing too. We can learn a lot from failure, but it's important that we learn the right lessons from failure. See, I grew up in a home with um, four boys. We ate a lot of food. And my mom decided uh, one time she was going to learn this recipe, how to make beignets. And she made some, and it was amazing. Made a whole bunch of them that we were going to have for a long time. And it was like a Friday night. Uh, She goes to bed. All of us boys are hanging out. We're watching a movie, playing games probably. And one by one, we're like running to the kitchen and coming back and running to the kitchen and coming back. And my mom woke up the next morning to find that all the beignets she had made that was maybe supposed to last a whole week was completely gone. She didn't even get to eat a single one. And she was so frustrated by that that she said, I will never, ever bake anything again. And that was over 20 years ago, and she still has never baked anything to this day. (laughs) There's a lot of lessons you can learn from failure. (laughs) And some of them are not great ones. And How we respond to failure makes the biggest difference. And there's some unhealthy responses to failure. Here's some of them that I found is that some of us, when we face failure, we want to deny everything. So act like it didn't happen. Well, that's not really that. We can just begin to like reinterpret every situation. Have you ever met that person that like clearly a situation was something that they failed at and they know how to spin it to make it actually look like a win somehow? And that's a denial mechanism. And then for some of us, we just avoid it altogether. I'm just not going to hang out with those people anymore. 
I'm just not going to go back over there anymore. I'm just not, not going to, I'm just going to avoid, avoid, avoid that thing that reminds me of my failure. Some of us can begin to blame shift as well. Put all the blame on, every, on everybody else. It's a work project that every person worked on together. But when the numbers come back and the numbers don't look great for that quarter, you have that coworker that is so quick to blame everybody else. It was all of you guys' fault for the group project and why it didn't go well. We can begin to, to blame everybody. And then for some of us, the way that we respond to failure is by projecting judgment on others. And those are the people that maybe in their past, something happened or somebody hurt them or did something and they can begin to take that and to project that on everybody that they meet. And it comes out in this way. When they meet new people or whatever it is, they struggle to trust people. They struggle to let people in because they're projecting failures from the past onto other people. And some people respond in anger and resentment. They just get angry about it, become resentful of everybody else who's doing well, who has, seems to have things going well for them. They can just begin to resent people and allow for that failure to just sink deep in their heart. And some people respond with self-doubt. They begin to make some of the always and the never statements. Well, this is just me. I'm always going to be bad at this. I'm never going to this. And they begin to allow for that failure to define them. Some people yet respond in isolation because they're hurt, because they're embarrassed by the failure. They can remove themselves from community and put up walls that nobody can break through. There are so many unhealthy ways that you and I can respond to, uh, to failure. But there's also some healthy ways that we can. And Peter models a healthy way to respond to failure. See, what happens is the resurrection happens and Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, finds that it's empty, comes back, tells the disciples about it. Peter is one of the first people to run to the tomb. And it says that Simon Peter came following John. When he went in, and when he got there, he went into the tomb and he saw with his own eyes the linen cloths lying there. See, Peter didn't run and hide from his failure having let down Jesus. He didn't just lay down and stay down. He persevered through it. He didn't stay down. He got back up. And I think it's, for, it's time for some of you in this room and the message that you need to hear today that you've been down long enough. You've been hiding long enough. You've been running long enough. And the resurrected Jesus who pulled off the greatest comeback of all time is telling you today it's time to get back up. It's time to get back up and to step back into your journey, to step back into the process that I've begun already in you the purpose and the calling that I have on your life, Peter didn't stay down. So why are some of us letting failure define who we are? Point number three, failure doesn't have to be your legacy. Failure doesn't have to be your legacy. After the resurrection, Jesus is going to appear three times to the disciples as recorded in the, in the Gospels. And the third time when he shows up to them in John uh, chapter 21, they're out fishing. And it says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was him. And he tells them, hey, cast the net on the right side because they hadn't caught anything all night. They're out there fishing in desperation. They don't catch anything. Jesus says, hey, cast the net on the right side. They cast the net there. All of a sudden, it begins to fill up with fish. So much that they're having a hard time pulling it back in. And they recognize in that moment, man, this is the same thing that Jesus did when he called them to come and to follow him in the beginning of the Gospels. And then John realizes it's Jesus. So he tells Peter, it is the Lord. And it says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment because he was stripped for work. He throws himself in the sea begins to like swim and like just run to try to get to Jesus as fast as possible. And then the rest of the disciples then come in dragging the net that is so full of fish at this moment. And they were not far out into the sea at that time. I just love so much that despite having failed Jesus three different times, Peter was still willing to swim and to run to Jesus. See, he knew something about the heart and the character, the nature of who Jesus is, that he could still run to him. And I want to remind somebody in here today to be quick to run to Jesus. Because what failure does sometimes is it can put distance between us and God. And we begin to treat God like he's some human being who you let down. And so now there's this awkward period of like, just let them cool down a little bit. Let them work on it. Maybe they're still holding a grudge. Let them get over it first before I come back to them. No, God is not a human being. If you come to him, if you repent, if you confess your sin, he is quick to forgive us and to restore us. Some of you in here need to be quick to run to Jesus because he's quick to forgive. 
You've been, you've been hiding from him for way too long. You've been keeping your distance from him for way too long. When he is quick to forgive you, if you will just run to him like Peter did. And it says that when they got out to land, they get back to land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus says to them, bring some fish. So Simon Peter goes and he hauls this net full of fish and they give some to Jesus. And he says, come and sit down and have breakfast together. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we lived in Africa and uh, we didn't have a lot of access to technology or a lot of those things. So when computers began to become a thing, we had like one laptop that somebody had gave to my dad and it was like a Windows, I don't know, 95 or 98 or something like that. And it was slow and my dad would sometimes just use it for work. And then every once in a while, if there's something really important, he would let one of us kids use it, you know, every once in a while. But we figured out a way to put some games on the computer but the problem with that was that every time you played games on the computer, this thing was so ancient and so weak that like it would overheat and then it would break down. Then we'd have to take it into an IT person to fix it. And so he ends up telling us, hey, you're not allowed to play video games on this computer. And if you want to use it, you have to ask for permission to use the family laptop. He's gone one day, and I know exactly where he keeps the laptop. It's in a case underneath his bed. I know exactly where to go. I pull out the laptop. I end up gaming on there for a couple hours. It overheats. It breaks down. I panic. I shut the lid real quick, stuck it back under the bed, came back an hour later, tried to turn it on. It's still not turning on. I'm like, oh, crap. It's broken. And I put it back under there, did what every normal kid would do, and I told nobody about it. Until a couple of days later, all of us kids are there together and my dad walks into the room and he pulls out the computer case and he sets it on the table in front of us. And right in that moment, I'm like, oh man, here we go. It's about to go down. <laughs> I'm going to have to fess up to this and it's not going to be good for me. And I just wonder for Peter, as they're on the boat and he's coming to shore on this beach and he sees this charcoal fire that is there. And Jesus is standing there by this charcoal fire. I just wonder if he wasn't thinking in his mind, man, the last time that I was with Jesus was around a charcoal fire when I was warming myself up and when I was denying him when he was at his lowest. Oh, crap. It's about to go down. This is the moment where finally Jesus, like that laptop, boom, on the table, is going to tell me, hey, uh, remember last time we were together around a fire and you stabbed me in the back when I was at my lowest and you denied me? But we serve the kind of God who doesn't do that. That Jesus could have brought Peter back to the charcoal fire to remind him of his past failures and past mistakes and how he let him down. No, no, no. Jesus uses the charcoal fire to redeem and to restore Peter. He says instead of using this to, to accuse you, to punish you, to show you how much you've messed up, I'm going to use this charcoal fire to make a meal for you, to invite you to come and sit down and have breakfast with me. To remind you that I still love you that I'm still for you, that what you did, your failures do not change our relationship. He uses the charcoal fire to show Peter what grace is, which is God's undeserved gift that he gives to us. We can never earn it, never deserve it, but he so freely gives it to us. Just think about this. I just wonder if Jesus had not done that. If Peter would have maybe carried on the rest of his life and every time he gets around a charcoal fire, man, he's brought back to that place. Last time I was around a charcoal fire was when I let down Jesus and I failed him. And I'm a failure. But no, Jesus steps in and he says, Peter, I'm going to take that memory that you have of failing me around a charcoal fire and I'm going to re replace it with a different memory of you sitting down and having a meal with me and being reminded that I love you and I still have a plan for your life. Don't you ever go around and walk around and look at charcoal fires in your life and be reminded of the guilt and the shame that you carry and allow for that to weigh you down. No, no, no. I still choose to call you friend. You are still my beloved, Peter. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. And I think some of us are walking around with too many charcoal fires in our lives. Situations that we get around that continue to remind us of our past failures. Maybe it's that for you, the marriage didn't work out and so you show up to weddings and you're putting on a smile, you're celebrating the new couple that's there and deep down you're just reminding yourself of man, that relationship that failed, 
that marriage that didn't turn out the way that you thought it was going to. Or maybe it's a coworker that gets a promotion and we're celebrating that. And in that moment, you're eating the cake in the office with everybody else. But you're just reminding, man, I wish that was me. I remember when I didn't do well in my job, didn't get the promotion or got fired or whatever it is. Man, I wonder what that must be like for him. Or maybe for some of you, the charcoal fire is that situation where you failed God, fell into sin, disappointed him. And now every single time you get around that thing and you see that thing, it just reminds you, man, remember what you did? How you let God down? And you, you did that again. And even maybe like Peter, some of us for multiple times, we've let him down. And what Jesus does is he comes in and he uses those moments to redeem them, to change them, and to give us a new memory of those moments. That's what grace does for every single one of us. Jesus uses Peter's failure to help him to discover grace. And I pray for some of you that today would be that day that you choose to surrender that charcoal fire to him, to allow for him to come into your life, to allow the comeback Jesus, the comeback God that we're talking about, to come in and to redeem and to restore that memory for you. And to replace it with a new one that reminds you of how much he loves you, how much he is for you, how much his plan in your life hasn't changed. And that's what he's going to go to do on here for Peter. That God actually uses Peter's failure. Get this. He actually uses Peter's failure to make him even more fit to lead the church. And it says this in verse 15, when they finished breakfast, Jesus says to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. He says to him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then a third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved in the moment the third time and because he kept asking him, do you love him? And Peter says, Lord... You know everything. You know my heart. You know what's in there. You know that I love you. And Jesus again says, feed my sheep. Three times he denied Jesus. Three times Jesus would restore him around the charcoal fire. And not only that, but Jesus would use this failure in Peter's life to take the zealous, overly confident, you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus, guy that Peter was to make him the guy that says, Jesus, you know everything. You know my heart. You know that I love you. To bring him to that place of humility and surrender where he can actually be used by God to become the shepherd that he would become for God's people. I just wonder if somebody like Peter had not gone through that own failure in his own life and he became the leader of the church. Can you imagine maybe how he would have dealt differently with other people's failures? But Jesus reminds him of his failure and uses it not to accuse him not to blame him but reminds him hey because you've tasted what failure is like and you've tasted how good grace is now I'm sending you to go be a shepherd for my people and to lead them with the same kind of grace that I have shown you and by the way it's the same kind of grace that he's calling every single one of us to extend to people that might fail us to be the kind of people that step into those situations and forgive and redeem and restore. And I just love the rest of Peter's story. Take a look at Acts chapter 2 verse 41. It says that they received the Holy Spirit and they begin to, to preach the gospel. And it says that Peter was one of the ones who was out there leading the charge and he's preaching the gospel. The people that heard Peter were so pierced to their hearts. And so they received the word that he was preaching. And it says this, that day alone... 3,000 souls were added to the church. Can you imagine that? The same Peter who maybe just a few days earlier was denying Jesus, gets restored. That same Peter now goes out in the power of the Holy Spirit, preaches a sermon. In one single sermon, 3,000 people give their lives to Jesus. You tell me that we don't serve a comeback God who can take our failures and make us fruitful out of it. That's what he does. That's what he did in Peter's life and he can do that for every single one of us because Jesus makes the comeback from failure to fruitfulness possible. And I know some of you, maybe you're arguing with God right now in your mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I know the resurrection and all of that and it's powerful. And like Jesus, you, 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 you pulled out the greatest comeback ever, but you don't understand the situation in my life. Jesus, you don't understand my failure. Like I, I know you can pull off any comeback, but you don't understand how badly I've messed up. 
Listen, like Peter, when we argue with God, we lose every single time because he said it over and over and again in his word as Jesus said it to the disciples that maybe with man it is impossible, but not with God because nothing is impossible for God. Even your greatest failures, he can redeem them, restore them, use them to make even more fit to be useful for the kingdom if you'll surrender to him and allow him to actually do that. If the tomb is empty, Anything is possible. Anything is possible. And for some of you in here today, here's, here's what I feel like I need to tell some of you. That maybe you failed God. Or maybe because of the failure of some of the sins in your own life. Whatever you're feeling today, the guilt and the shame that you're carrying You've maybe not been to church in a really long time. And if you're being honest, last Sunday, Easter was the first time that you came back to church in a really long time because there's been this distance between you and God because you just don't know where you stand with God. You just don't know how he feels about you. And I just want to tell you, if that's you today, that God doesn't define you by your failures. He defines you by what, by what Jesus did for you. That when God looks at you, he doesn't see all your past mistakes and all the ways that you've let him down. No, he looks at you and he looks at his son who hung on a cross for you. He looks at his hands and his side that was pierced for you and the blood that came out of it that covers all your sins, that makes you new. He looks at the empty tomb that was left empty because he walked out of there victorious and is now standing in front of the Father interceding for every single one of us. God looks at you and he doesn't look at your sin and your brokenness and your failures. He looks at you and he sees his son and what his son has done for you. So why are you still standing at a distance from God? But man, he, he's waiting with arms wide open to receive you. That man, he is so quick to forgive to restore, that any person who genuinely comes to him and repents of their sin, he is so, so quick and so willing and so able to completely forgive you, to restore and to redeem you. So why are you still standing at a distance? Can I just remind you of the love that he has for you? That his word says that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, that Christ died for us. Not when you had cleaned up your act. No, when you were still a sinner, Christ died for you anyways. That's how much he loves you. Oftentimes we just forget that. So can I just, if that's you in the room or watching online right now, can I just plead you to just run to Jesus, swim to him, do whatever you have to do like Peter did and find that his love is enough for you. His grace is sufficient for you. He wants to restore you because he's not done with you yet. He wasn't done with Peter yet. That the legacy that Peter left is a legacy of faithfulness, of leading the church, writing some of the books that we have in the New Testament, and even on to death that Peter was crucified upside down because he said that he was not worthy to die in the same way that Jesus did. So they crucified him upside down. That when it came down to it, what we remember Peter for was his faithfulness. And that's the story of what God did in his life because we serve a God who's a comeback God, who can take your failures and use them to make you more fit and to use them to make you more fruitful even for the kingdom if you will allow him to do that. Pray with me. God, I just think about in my own life, God, you've been so good to me. The countless times that I have failed you, that I've let you down, denied you and God the countless time that over over again you continue to restore to restore to restore to remind me of your love to remind me that you're not done with me yet to remind me that you still have a call on my life you have a plan and a purpose for me God I just say thank you and I just pray for that person in the room right now Maybe who's being weighed down by guilt and by shame from their past, from some of their failures, that they would just find freedom at the foot of the cross today. That they would know that Jesus went to a cross and bore all of their failures, all of their sin, all of their shame. He bore it on the cross for them. That they don't have to continue to walk around with it. That today's the day that they choose to lay that down, to surrender it all to you. And then maybe for that person who feels like they've messed up too much, they're just too far gone. Would you remind them today that no one is too far from God. No one is too far from, to experience the transformation that Jesus can bring. That they would surrender their lives to you today and experience new life. That as you say in your word, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. 
the old is gone, the new has come that they would surrender their lives to you and find that that is true. And for the person that needs to be reminded of that, that they are new in Jesus today, would you remind them of that right now? God, we love you. We surrender ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We're going to move now into a special time of communion. You should have received the elements on the way in, but if you didn't, just raise a hand. One of our ushers will find you and give you those elements. But as Jesus did, he's all about always laying out a meal before us, as he did at that charcoal fire on the beach to remind them that, hey, I love you. We're still friends. I'm with you in this. He did the same thing for every single one of us on the night when he was betrayed. When he took bread, he broke it. When he took the cup, he blessed it. And he instructed all of his disciples to do this, to gather around this meal, to be reminded of all that he's done for us. So we're going to step into that right now. And it's an opportunity for us to look back on what Jesus has done for us and to simply just thank him for it. And we're going to be worshiping as well as we do that. And if you need prayer for anything, head right back into that prayer room right there. We have team members that will be happy to pray with you today. Let's stand and let's worship together.
team for leading us in worship all day all morning really appreciate you guys for that and hey coming up next week is the first step class which is meant to be a first step into engaging in the life of the church we say this a lot but you get out of church what you put into it and so if you're just attending a church uh, on a church service that's fine we're glad you're doing that but man you're missing on so much more that church could be for you so come to that next week 11:45 in room 7 child care and lunch are provided for that to make it easy so that you can just attend that. Sign up at the First Step table. And if you're new, thank you for joining us. Stop by the First Step table. Pick up a gift that we have for you as well. And with all the events happening, just go to the website. That's the best place to go and view all the different upcoming events. I love you guys. Have an amazing rest of your week. We're dismissed. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope that you come back next week and invite a friend. And remember, live boldly and love deeply.